Hi, so we're going to get started with tonight's meeting. I just need to read that paragraph to you about the Zoom meetings. This meeting is being held remotely as an alternate means of public access pursuant to an order issued by the governor of Massachusetts dated March 12, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the town of Hingham in accordance with the open meeting law, and it is being recorded. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify the chair at the start of the meeting in accordance with MGLC 30A section 20F, so that the chair may inform all other participants of said recording. So besides me, is there anybody else who's, and this will go up on the cloud, um, is there anybody else who wants to be recording the meeting for themselves? Okay, and the only other thing I uh, wanna say is, um, I got a um, note from Michelle last month. Uh, if, if you go to the bottom of your screen, you can click on live transcript and you can be reading all the words across the bottom of the screen that everybody's saying. And in case it's hard to hear everything, it's, it's just another way to, to make sure you're getting everything that everybody is saying. Um, before I, uh, we go to the voting on the two sets of minutes, does anybody have any uh, announcements that they wanna make that something came in within the last 48 hours? No, oh, great, okay. Um, in the interest of efficiency tonight, especially with, with everything that's going on, and I know our minds are all in two places at once, um, I'm, I'm hoping that we can um, run things smoothly, just get to the points, um, really really speak to the substance of the applications themselves. Um, but okay, but anyway, so let's, let's get to the two sets of minutes. Uh, a vote on the, num does anybody want to make a motion uh, to approve the minutes of the November 18th meeting? I'll make a motion, Vicki. Seconded? Second, Charlie. Any discussion? Okay. Um, I, have, I have one comment, Mr. Chairman. I think there's a typographical error in one of the paragraphs, but that's it. Okay, Who, were those Vicki minutes or Charlie minutes? Those were Vicki's. So can you tell them what it is? So she sure on the under the bold heading minutes, the second line in, I think it means uh, or should say at the next meeting. Right now it says NET. I just think it's a typo. Oh, okay. Okay. So Vicky, if you could do that and then get it yes. to me, I'll, okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, we have to take a roll call vote. So yes. um, I'll start. All in favor? Larry, yes. I'll call out names. Bill? Okay, you're muted, by the way. Can you unmute? Okay. Yes. 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 Kirsten? Yes. Charlie? Yes. Judy? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Megan? Yes. And there's one, who am I missing? Vicki. Vicki? Yes. Are you a yes? Great. Okay. And does anybody want to make a motion to accept the minutes from the December 9th meeting? Judy, so moved. Second it. Vicki will second it. Any discussion? Yes, I just want to um, add that um, we make um, it clear that Tom Roby has recused himself this year. And I think rather than have him be absent at the next two minute, uh, meetings, he has you know, said that he is not able to join us so that um, we are, he should not be listed here because other than that, it looks like he's not voting and there's some issue. And I think it's better to say that he's recused. Either the minutes can say he's uh, recused himself, but we need to uh, identify that. Okay, I think that's good. So Charlie, can you add that in? Yes. Any other discussion? Can I just ask, I, I was doing something else. I, I know you're talking about that before. Does that impact the, the quorum or not? Uh, in this case, it does not. We, it's still a quorum of five. Okay. Yeah, if we went down to seven, it would change, but it, it not, uh, yeah, no, it doesn't. It does not impact the quorum. I have one deletion that I would request. Yeah. On page three, <laughs> under the bold print other, I would suggest that we delete other and uh, the entire paragraph uh, following that. Um, and my thinking is this, um, 
Larry made a very genuine and heartfelt uh, apology to Andrea. At least that's how I perceived it. I thought it was extremely gentlemanly and classy, but I don't think we should forever have a record that shows that there was any comment of a negative nature that required an apology, particularly because I went back and looked at the prior minutes and there's nothing in the prior minutes that suggests that anything untoward was said. And so I just think that that doesn't need to be part of the permanent public record. And I, I don't say that to uh, in any way minimize or denigrate the apology that Larry made. I just think that you know, it, it doesn't need to be there forever for anyone to see because I think our chairman uh, does his very level best to conduct a fair, open meeting. And I, I don't want a permanent record that suggests anything to the contrary. Thanks, Kevin. I'm going to turn it over to Charlie to see, because it concerns me. Charlie, can you just lead this part and see if there's agreement or disagreement with Kevin and you seven should decide whether it's mm -hmm. in and goes out. Yeah, so I um, I appreciate your, your, your comments, Kevin, and, and I'm happy to, to make um, adjustments to, to that based on your, your explanation. And uh, I, I too would support that because I think we, the apology was sincere and I think um, it, it seemed to be heartfelt and I, I would, I would, I would have put a um, motion to uh, delete that. So Charlie, you want to see if anybody else wants to contribute? Does anybody else? Yeah, have any? I, I guess my comment is I'm for. I don't think it's an official act of the the board or the commission, so it doesn't really need to be in the minutes. So I would be agreeable to deleting it. So you've got three. You just need a fourth. Yeah. Anybody else? Did you hear? I wasn't me? present, but I don't. Oh, Judy, go. Judy. Yeah. Okay. okay, so I will, um, I think I see four there. So I will make it, I will uh, amend the minutes as, as suggested by Kevin. Okay, okay, great. So we just need to vote on them with, oh, unless there's any other discussion. Okay, so let's do a roll call vote. Larry, yes. Bill? Yes. Kirsten? Yes. Charlie? Yes. Judy? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Megan? Yes. And Vicki? Yes. Great. Okay, so I've notified the applicants before today. Oh, by the way, is oh uh, Marcos here? Okay, that um, each application will get ten minutes for presentation maximum. And then um, the the committee will have a chance to question or comment for a little bit, and um, after that, I, I will open it out to the audience. However, I want to be very clear that. Um, things said by the audience tonight should not be advocacy or against a project. If you want to advocate for a project or tell us why we shouldn't vote for a project, please write a letter to cpc at hingham-ma.org. If the audience is going to speak tonight, I would um, ask that they really uh, make their questions specific to any confusion about the presentation or about the application, in other words, simply for um, clarification. So with that in mind, um, it's 710, let's go to the Dock House Museum and Bathrooms and Outdoor Pavilion. And I did see- um, Claudia. Claudia, there you are. So do you need the screen, Claudia? Yes. Okay. Kirsten, can you give her the screen? Yeah. Okay. Okay, you should be able to go down to screen share, Claudia. We see it. Okay, great. Everybody see that? Thank you. I was <laughs> muted. <laughs> Uh, thank you again for hearing me another time regard, um, regarding our exciting project at Bear Cove Park. Um, I just want to reiterate the vision of that Bear Cove Park provides its guests a safe haven to enjoy nature, exercise, beauty, wildlife, and the history of the Hingham's Ammunition Depot that sourced three major American wars during the 20th century. 
as you remember or recall that there was a, over 100 buildings that were removed from this uh, 484 acres um, by the Army Corps of Engineers and the park was deeded to Hingham as an open space area for park use for both recreation, conservation and enjoyment. Uh, funding, we have $50,000 that our Bear Cove Park Committee has voted to use on this project. The money was sourced from the Cove Apartments that are adjacent to the park. Um, and so that's, that's our, our in, so to speak. I, I wanna move right to the, um, so we have stakeholders, as you recall, and you'll, you'll all receive a copy of this presentation. I'll send it to Larry. Um, but I've heard, there are some questions I've heard that, um, that you might have that I wanna just address right away. Um, what are the resources as again, I mentioned the $50,000 donation. The, our committee strength uh, has never been stronger. We're, we're a board of nine citizens of both long-term, medium-term and new members. And we have the energy to do this project. So we're excited to do it. And I just want you to be aware that we've got resources to work on this project. Um, the other resource is the park layout is if you haven't been to the park, some of you uh, joined us, there's paved walkways, wooded trails and waterways that are conducive to a variety of activities um, as well as passive enjoyment. So people can actually get to the Dock House Museum by boat. They can run there, they can ride their bike there. Um, there's the wooded trails. The other form of resource that the, and reason for the park layout is that it's a wonderful race um, activity. Off, uh, we've had it on average, not in 2020, but in other years, um, six on six races. And that is a form of some funding as well because there's donations that come to the Bear Cove Park because of those races. You asked about operations. The Dock House Museum is open to the public on weekends during the spring, summer, and fall. It's managed by a volunteer committee and coordinated by Scott McMillan, our, our ranger. The hours of operation are the second and fourth Sunday at 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., weather permitting. As you recall from touring, when you open the doors, if it's a, a blustery rainy day, it could damage uh, the artifacts in there. So that's how we have to leave that parameter there. Um, <clears throat> groups are allowed in and managed by request. The anticipated maintenance um, of the Dock House Museum post renovation is very little. It's all within the, the job scope of the park ranger's responsibilities, including training and maintenance of the geothermal, solar, battery and ecological compost systems. Maintenance of the pavilion and bathrooms will be part of the park ranger's responsibilities as identified in his job description. Just to reiterate, we're, we're asking for funds to repair the roof, improve the lighting via skylights, level the, the floor, add another door, add plumbing, bathroom, janitor's closet, ventilation, or uh, supporting um, a climate for the, for the um, artifacts and potentially update the interior walls. The benefits to the town include um, field trips for, from school, for school kids, use of the waterfront, um, focused activity in the central part of the park for eating and bathroom use, state-of-the-art technology. This is really a fun part of the project is to demonstrate to the town of Hingham, there are ways of construction that can happen that are, that are ecologically minded. And as we all think about the renovations on our homes, we can take a walk by there and take a look. Offer comfort stations to hikers and bikers, Senior citizens, we will see more of them because of the bathroom, I believe. Um, covered shelter for picnicking and also to provide a meeting spot for those who go to the museum. But also one of our, our long range plans is to have the Youth Conservation Corps developed and use our, our 484 acre park to help us um, support this wonderful ecosystem. Uh, 
The way we would, de we would um, determine success is increased use of the museum, greater community use of that space, including the pavilion, um, good reviews from citizens through social media, and a request to use the park through family events, weddings, um, scout organizations, that sort of thing. Control of the site is through the, the selectman, through a deed of the Department of Interior. The question was, was uh, raised about feasibility. Um, our town engineer, uh, J.R. Fry, uh, helped us tremendously in looking at the cost efficiencies and comparisons of the solar energy versus wind versus aerial power, electrical aerial power. So we determined that the wind turbines wouldn't be very um, good, especially for the um, wildlife in the area, the birds. Um, so we did a comparison of solar energy to aerial power, which, which is basically electrical wires. It would take about five or six poles that it would need to be set across the park in order to drag uh, electrical energy up to the dock house. Um, he also looked at water and whether we could um, connect into the town facilities for water and determined that after calculating the amount of pipe and uh, digging that would, would, it would be better to dig a well for water. And while we're digging wells, let's look at geothermal. Um, and that was a wonderful idea that JR uh, came up with that geothermal would actually support the Dock House Museums um, with the use of heat pumps. So basically what geothermal is, is cutting, is digging down about four to five feet below the surface of the building, drilling two, drilling down and then creating a closed loop underneath the, the floor. Um, with, through the use of heat pumps, it maintains a consistent temperature in the building throughout the year, about 50 degrees, which would preclude any need for us to get any kind of air conditioning or heating. So I thought that was a pretty cool thing. Um, so that's basically um, a summary of what was provided from our engineer. Uh, and there are financial comparisons that we could share if you'd like to see them. Here's a list of uh, three architects who actually came out to the site, spent some time talking with us and provided uh, in, um, some insight into our plans. Here's a rendering from AKT of the Dock House Museum, an aerial view with the pavilion situated facing south as it should. So some of you who went out there, you could take a look at um, where we were and the area that we were thinking of putting the pavilion. And is that what it would, I'm sorry, okay. I'll hold, keep going. Okay, thank you. Again, our, our emphasis is on green architecture, green development. Um, and, and so that would be the challenge here is to, is to, is to use the pavilion to support the solar panels that would source the energy for both the Dock House Museum and the pavilion and the bathrooms. I'm moving on to costs. Uh, there's no change in estimated costs for the Dock House Museum, um, except for the ge geothermal venting, which is $40,000. That's 30 32,000 for the drilling and 8,000 for the heat pumps and the connections. The items that are identified in, the in bold, the roof, the electrical and the paneling are all part of the solar uh, energy system that would go on to the pavilion, but would be used by the dock house. And that's why I've included them in the dock house museum estimated costs. I've removed the janitor's closet drinking fountain costs because we are trying to stay within our budget at this point. The $375,000 is for the dock house museum and the Bear Cove committee would, uh, would um, ask that the $50,000 be applied to that so that the ask from the CPC is 325,100. So I should put that on the voting sheet, 325? 
Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. Cost for recreation. Uh, they, I spend, I spent the week talking to the bathroom guy that, <laughs> and, um, so the $50,000 was the original price we had for the public bathroom. Um, and that basically is the container. And I'll show you in, the, in this picture here. I'm sorry. Let me just show you the pavilion. Uh, these are renderings done by AKT. It is basically a frame structure that would, that would hold the, the solar panels above and create the, the, um, the structure. Uh, attached the, the building attached to that is the ba the bathroom and a mechanical room to support the energy generators that are needed with the solar panels. Claudia, you're at 11 minutes. Can you? I can wrap it up. Okay. I just wanted to say that in terms of the looking at this ecology bathroom, uh, the the price out was that the fifty thousand dollars is basically the cabin, and everything else has its own price, including the vault below for the wastewater was $7,000. Um, and it's added cost to, to do the rainwater um, elements. We would get a $3,000 uh, credit if we source the water ourselves. So hence the well, the well water might be a good, a good um, cost savings in that one. I just wanted, you'll, you, you will receive this. You'll also receive the solar design panel. And you can, if you want, those of you who enjoy reading about the energies and how that was and the um, numbers they're in this document as well as some pictures of solar panels what they look like from below and a letter of support from the Hingham crew and I do appreciate your time and thank you for hearing us out. Thanks Claudia. Vicki as liaison do you have any questions or comments? Uh, no, uh, I guess the only question that I'll ask Claudia because I asked her to see if this is possible uh, did you have a chance to talk with JR today, or it, it, he may even be on the call regarding project manager for town properties? I did pose that question to him and I did not hear from him. I'm not sure if he's on the call. I, is he? JR, are you here? Kirsten, can you tell? JR, uh, F R E I, Claudia, if you can stop sharing, yeah. I can then see. Yeah. Thank you. And, and I only bring it up again um, for people who are newer on the committee, having been on the committee back in the day when we had a town engineer as part of CPC, all town projects always had the project manager, if it was a town project, was the town engineer. Now, a lot has changed in the town. I don't know if that's true. Um, you know, I know Claudia has been working herself crazy on this, but I do just throw that out because as you'll see, there's a 7% uh, fee in there for project manager. And I think it's important for this committee. I, I'm only trying to help with this project, but if if we were to know that, uh, this project would go down by 7%. So I think it is something- Who am I looking for, sorry? JR, I think he would have spoken up if he- Yeah, did. no. JR Fry, F-R-E. Yeah, so, no. yeah. so anyway, I, I just bring that up um, only because I think it's something that um, I've seen with every town project uh, in the past that a town engineer becomes the project manager. So. Um, I don't expect Claudia to be able to answer that, but if JR was here, I was hoping he could. And in the meantime, I do think it's important that we get an answer to that before our vote next week, because I think that's an important uh, piece to this project. Thank you. Will do, yeah. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Okay, Kevin I just Burke have a here. Oh, sorry, what? Kevin Burke here, Claudia. Um, as you know, we've got more money in ask than we have in funds. If you had to rank your three project segments in terms of priority of ask, how would you rank them? Um, we have not ranked them because they are so integral for each other. We need, we, our, our effort began with the work on the, on the Dock House Museum. So I would have to say the Dock House Museum is the primary focus um, we think that 2020 demonstrates that the park is really a popular place for people to gather and, um, and to control in terms of where people will gather is probably the right thing for Bear Cove Committee to do. And that's why the pavilion has many use, useful reasons for being where it's lo being located next to the Dock House Museum. And certainly everybody's been asking for a bathroom. We, we, we actually use the, 
porta potties for a period of time until the health department told us they had to go. Um, and they and we found that they were um, somewhat beneficial. Most people enjoyed them. There's a lot of it's, the jury's still out in that one. So having a bathroom in the park in a central location is something that uh, many folks have told us that they're looking for. I hope that answers your question. Others? Okay, I just have a couple of quick administrative questions, Claudia, because I need to get this right for the committee before next week. So uh, uh, is the pavilion still at 155 and the bathroom still at 50? Because are those the numbers you want us to vote on for those two? No, um, the, the bathrooms have gone up to 67. 67, yeah, okay, me, and the pavilion? And um, I'm sorry. The pavilion is at 213. Okay. Again, and, and as Vicki said, that was, that includes the 7% project manager. So, um, you know, the, the bottom line cost of it is 167. Uh, and we, we had to put in 10% for the architect, 7% for the project manager and 10% for environment in, in the pavilion. So that's why we're at 213. So I just need to know for the voting sheet, do you want me to put 67,000 for the bathroom? Yeah, 67,800 for the bathroom. And what do you want me to put for the pavilion? Uh, 213. Just for the pavilion? For the pavilion, I'm and sorry. That, let's, let's remove the project management from that and call that 204. Because that's what we had before, right? We had 155 before, so I'm a little confused. We did. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not sure you added. Uh, again, this comes with where are the uh, so oh, the the fifty the fifty thousand dollars that the Bear Cove was gonna was was going to originally going to go to the pavilion. Okay. Go to the pavilion. Yeah. So are we at two o two o four for the pavilion? Two o four for the pavilion. Okay, sixty seven eight for the bathroom, two o four for the pavilion, and three twenty five for the museum. Yes. Three twenty five one hundred. Three twenty five one. Thank you, Nikki. Right. And um, Claudia, the rendering that you showed us, is that the pavilion? That's what it would look like? Um, that we have, Vicki asked us for the rendering last week. Um, and so we were happy to take what we could get, basically. Um, we, we have found um, pavilions uh, within our price range that are a little bit, little bit larger and made of timber. Um, which this one demonstrates um, that a little bit more attractive. Um, so that that is a safe view of what we're looking for. Um, you don't have to apologize for it. I know. Yes. <laughs> are we looking at the thing we're being asked to vote on? That's what I'm asking. You. Yes, of course. You are looking yes. at it. Yes. You are. Okay. Well, yes. Okay. Uh, it's in this particular case, it's 1,200 square feet. We are looking for something that. That's um, that would cover 50 people, which is not necessarily. He thinks he had said he thought he could squeeze 48 people under that. My, in my opinion, it should be a 30 by 60 platform. Okay. And, but it and, looks like that, and then it looks like the bathroom is behind one side of it, right? Yeah, the bathroom as well as the maintenance. Um, that there needs to be some sort of an enclosure for the the energy, the, the the maintenance that comes off the solar panels. Okay, so and the bathroom's closer to the Dock House Museum, right? Again, that can be moved easily. Okay, all right. Yeah. Any anything else from my committee, Judy? I would. Hi, Claudia. That was a very thorough and well considered um, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I following up on um, uh, an earlier question. Um, you're saying that the the primary of the three projects, the primary project is the museum. Um, in my mind, as a user of that park, the bathrooms and the sort of, um, and the pavilion as more outdoor uses, because I think of the park as an outdoor space for, for outdoor recreation, enjoyment. How can the museum be the more important of the three uses? It's probably because, as I said, the board is made up of 
people who've been there for a long period of time and those of us who've been there for a mediocre period of time, medium, and then there's those that have been a short time. And when we developed our ideas, we were focused on supporting the Bear Cove as we know it. And that was the Dock House Museum. So this, I, 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 I hear what you're saying. We, the recreational part of this, of this park is, is something that um, you know, we're moving more towards. But the Dock House Museum has been there and has been gnawing at us to be repaired. And so it started off with, let's repair the Dock House Museum. And the best way to do that is to capitalize on, on the market research we did with, um, with folks who say, yeah, we do want bathrooms and we do want to be able to gather. Um, it, it just the gathering and using the solar energy made a perfect sense to us. But we, we need energy in the Dock House Museum. We need, we need the energy there. What we're using is a loud generator that we plug in or put gas in and, and open the doors and let people in to see it. Other comments or questions from the committee? I, I don't know. I, I really love these projects, except I'm, I am just worried about sort of long-term funding of them. And, you know, as we've seen this year and, you know, hopefully nothing like this happens again for another hundred years, um, you know, fundraisers can't necessarily happen like things happen you know maintaining the bathrooms maintaining the museum that sort of thing as as a long-term uh thing it's just it's going to need sort of a constant supply of money and and i'm i'm concerned about about where that's coming from um and if there's any sort of like efforts to to keep like a reserve fund or that sort of thing to to help out Absolutely, um, Megan. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, the Dock House Museum has been there for 10 years. Um, so, and, and it has been maintained under the budget that we have in existence. We've had no huge increases in our budgets. Um, the other thing is that through these races that we have in the area, we have generated a Friends of Bear Cove account that is substantial um, that we can use to, de to develop and move and and support and maintain the, these items that we're asking for. Um, the other thing is that came to mind is that when, once you have a pavilion, an attractive pavilion, it might be a great location to do family reunions and weddings, and that will generate donations to the park as well. Um, so I think it's self-sustaining, to be honest with you. Okay, thank you. Others on the committee? Okay, are there any specific questions about the application from people who are here tonight, but not on the committee. Not your thoughts, whether you like the project or not, but just if you have anything that needs clarification. Anybody? Kirsten, is anybody raising their hand? No. Great. Okay, thank you, Claudia, so much. You're welcome. And I'll, thank you. I'll put those new numbers into the voting sheets. Thank you. Okay. So next up is the restoration of the four historical and also military memorials. And um, Andrea Young will present. Andrea, I know I saw you. Oh, there you are. Yeah, even though it says Kate Richardson, it's me. Ah, OK, that would explain. I was like, that I would explain it, yeah, because I, I just uh, logged in under her um, thing. So anyway, um, there's really not much that I have to add about our project. As you know, this is a joint effort um, with uh, Keith German and the Historical Commission. And it includes um, three memorials and uh, three memorial br bronze plaques and one bronze plaque that is attached to a, a glacial boulder. Um, and then there is also the, um, the Master Sergeant, Marine Master Sergeant, um, Canine Memorial, and let's see. And the other, the final thing is um, the William Newey Memorial, and um, the plaque for all who serve. So that's um, nothing has changed there. Um, we have um, my request is for fifteen thousand dollars, and unfortunately, um, I'm sorry that I was not able to get. Um, additional 
quotes. Um, we have the quote from uh, Larry's, uh, the people that Larry had spoken to and that I think comes in at, Larry, what is it? Well, they said 53 to you, but I then had a subsequent conversation and said, does that include a 15% contingency? And he said, no, the way the contract would work is the town would be on the hook for, in, if it went 15% above, but then they would be on the hook for anything over that. And 15% of 53 is eight. So you really want to think of it as 6,100 rather than 5,300. Thanks, Larry. That's great. So um, <clears throat> despite that, uh, our request remains at, at 15,000. And uh, the plan is to use our new procurement officer who will write up a request for um, proposals. We're not going to send out um, a request for bids because the work is far too um, delicate to uh, rely on uh, the lowest bidder. So there are standards that we'll have to include in the proposal, the, the request for proposals, such as um, the uh, adherence to the Secretary of the Interior standards for the treatment of, of um, historic objects and the code of ethics and standards of the practice of the American Institute for Conservation of Artistic and Historic Works. Um, so we are gonna take into consideration um, all of the, uh, the backgrounds and um, qualifications of those who do apply. So I think that will give us an opportunity to um, <clears throat> as 15,000 as the high mark, um, give us an opportunity to uh, see other proposals from um, a number of other vendors who might be interested in, in um, submitting a proposal. Great, thanks Andrea. Bill, do you wanna ask or comment on any of this as since you're the liaison? Uh, no, I don't have any questions right now. Okay. Anybody else on the committee? Uh, this is Vicki. I guess my only question would be if um, if the if you got quotes under that and we had already because obviously you can't do procurement until we voted and they were able to do more monuments. Um, I mean, I know from uh, hearing Keith before, there are more monuments to go. Would we be able to do more this year? I mean, if we have the money and we can and you and you find the right vendor and they come with the standards, would it be possible? I don't know if that's possible. Thank you, Vicki. I think that that would be quite possible. It wouldn't be possible. Um, I mean, it would, it's humanly possible the, the way the grant- You're saying because it's not on the application. Because okay. you're gonna get a grant agreement and it will say those four monuments, so- Understood. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I just, um, want to make a couple of comments. Andrea and I had a fruitful phone conversation today. We didn't agree, but it was still a fruitful conversation. And um, she made it clear to me that she wants to go through the procurement process because we just have the two estimates right now. And it would be good to see um, what else is out there and what it might come in at. And um, also the procurement officer would be very, very clear in the RFP about what what the town is looking for to happen with the monuments and would be very clear on the specs that would have to come back. And I understand that and I respect it and, and I appreciate it. Uh, what I wanna say is if a project comes in at under 10,000, the town does not have to go through a procurement process. And um, what we didn't get to talk about at the December 9th meeting, uh, were the qualifications of Kevin Duffy and, and Bill Schur. Kevin is the stone guy and Bill is the um, metal guy. And um, I, I'll just say very quickly, because I've been through both of their websites, Kevin is um, a stone sculptor in addition to being a monument conservator. He received a dual degree in fine arts and applied arts from the Art Institute in Rotterdam. Monuments he has restored include the Mayflower Women's Memorial in Plymouth, 
the World War I Memorial in Belmont and the Veterans Memorial in Maynard. Um, these are all very intricate. Some of them are made of marble, um, which is harder to work with. It's fingers and toes and cleaning those kinds of things. Bill Schur of Skylight Studios, who would be doing the plaque cleaning. Um, he's also a, sculpt, a sculptor, um, not, and, but also a, and a restorer. And works he has restored are at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, Boston's Museum of Fine Arts, the Slater Museum in Connecticut, many national park sites, Yale, Harvard, et cetera, et cetera. So I, again, I understand Andrea's feeling, I don't know these guys, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not comfortable just going with that. I, I think their um, qualities are stellar. And I, I know one of them, I know the stone guy, I don't know the plaque guy. And I think it's important for our committee to think about this as we, as we uh, vote our recommendations. I think they would do an Audi of a job, not a Ford Pinto of a job. <laughs> But Andrea and I do not agree on the approach. I, I want to be clear about that. We, um, just, yeah. May I say that um, if you would like me to, I can, uh, since you went through the list of all of their accomplishments, I can easily do the same with, um, with Daedalus, if you'd like me to do that. I'm not sure what the point would be. I think the... Um, the idea is that anybody who has the appropriate qualifications would have an opportunity to present um, their uh, proposal and um, and essentially uh, throw in their hat in the ring to do the work. So, and if and if those two gentlemen uh, want to do that, that's great. Um, if you chose them to do that, we wouldn't need to go through the procurement process. I, Daedalus, you gave us their claims to fame and they're equally outstanding. And that's kind of my point. I, I don't think it's apples and oranges. I think it's apples and apples, but I, I respect your desire for an RFP and for more uh, um, proposals to come in. I, I, I respectfully disagree that we need that and, and you are heard by the committee as to why you feel it's important. And I, I wanted to bring this up. So the committee, you know, the, each committee member will make their decision. Okay, but I don't think anybody, I haven't read, I haven't, we haven't taken a straw poll, Andrea, but I don't get the sense that anybody in the room, this isn't a good project. I don't think anybody here is thinking, we don't like this, we don't wanna go forward with this. I can't swear it because we haven't discussed it, but right. that's a good thing. I, I, Very, I understand that, you know, they, but this is not just about um, the lowest cost. This is um, about methodology. This is about documentation. Um, and to be honest, um, your, the stone guy um, didn't include in his proposal doc, the, the degree of documentation that we have always in the past received from Daedalus. Um, uh, Bob Shure, he probably does that. Um, I looked at his website and, uh, you know, it's just, uh, but Larry, <laughs> you know, what's, what's the problem with going through the procurement process? I, I don't wanna go back and, I don't have anything to add. I don't think it's necessary in this case. I, I think, Daedalus is stellar. I think these guys are stellar and, and one group is 10,000 less than the other group. So, and I understand why you want to go through the procurement process. I'd like to spend less money up front and, and get the job done and have you be happy and see how great they can turn out and come back next year and ask for more projects and we'll be able to get more done because you'll see how we can get a really fantastic job done for less money. But we're just, we're gonna go back and forth with each other. The group has heard both of us. I think each, each of the other committee members will, will make their decision about how much they wanna, whether they wanna vote toward the project, but I don't expect that they don't want to and how much they wanna vote. The rest of it is just you and me disagreeing. I, I don't think it will get us anywhere. I don't either. Comment, may I make a comment? Is that Kevin? It is. Yeah. 
it seems to me that if we, um, and it seems like there's advocacy for a reduced amount now for uh, this project, but if we, and, and I don't, I think we were tonight supposed to ask questions and get presentation, but since there's been this advocacy or debate over procurement or a no procurement because there's a lesser amount awarded, it seems to me that you would then be defining the outcome by the process. And what I mean by that is if you award less, then you're eliminating the higher priced vendor from the process, essentially. You're ensuring that it goes to the lower price vendor as opposed to using a chapter 30B uh, request for proposals process in which you can set out a set of bid specifications and qualifications requirements, and then you can make a price and quality comparative analysis as required by chapter 30B. And I, I just think that um, the applicant is entitled to proceed as the applicant wishes. And I just would not want us to prejudge the outcome by cramming down a procurement or less than 10,000 procurement as opposed to an RFP process. Thank Great. you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, and also, I appreciate your comments are appreciated. And our committee has wider latitude than I'm going to be affording to the audience tonight, which is why our discussion can uh, be a little broader. Um, um, I do have, uh, Kevin could not join us tonight. I mean, Keith could not join us tonight. So I do have a statement that he would have asked us to read. Is that all right? Oh, please, yeah. Okay. Um, he wrote that discussion for consideration of this project should not be centered around will we do it, but why haven't we done it already? Keep Hing historic Hingham historic by preserving the past for future generations to see and understand. That was Keith's statement. Thank you. Anybody else on our committee with comments or questions? Anybody in the, on the floor? Do you have a specific question about this project? Great, thank you so much, Andrea. Thank and you. now we're up to the Hingham Affordable Housing Trust. And uh, Amy, are you gonna be presenting? Yeah, Amy yes. Farrell for the trust, great. Yes. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, Amy Farrell, 95 Central Street with the Affordable Housing Trust. And um, as part of this evening's discussion, we thought it might be helpful to provide folks a snapshot of where the trust's current financial condition is, the current financial resources we have, what our current commitments are, and if awarded the CPA grant, what we would do with those funds. Um, Amy, would you like to share your screen? I, I would, thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna give you that ability. Okay. And let's make sure I do this properly. Um, if you go down to the bottom, you should be able yeah, to share. No, I just, I, I'm, I'm trying to do what Larry told me to do, which was make sure I had the right document, right, <laughs> ready and visible. It should be right behind your Zoom screen. I know, I know, you told me what to do. Make sure you I'm... close it all out. <laughs> okay, um, so let you should see um, oh, an Excel workbook here. And, um, a couple things. So as part of this or in preparation for this, um, we sent along to Larry, who I believe has shared with CPC, um, a narrative summary of what I'll, I'll be walking through. And what you see in front of you, and I actually, um, um, I, I may have to move the screen a bit um, as I share different things. Um, but this is meant to be a, um, kind of a, a, a graphic depiction. And um, I apologize, um, I had this set up a little differently to start, but um, what I'll, I'll do is just, I'll kick it off and then um, be mindful of the time allotted, Larry, and um, we'll go to questions. Um, so, Right now, the trust currently has um, 
approximately $320,000 in resources. And that includes, um, excuse me, $340,000 in resources. And that includes um, the assumption of the $272,000 that would be transferred to the trust from our 2020 award. Um, and that will allow us um, to be back in the um, positive for our opportunity fund. And the, um, well, apologies, my, my narrative is, is a little, and um, the, the grant actually we will have, with the grant we restore our opportunity fund and then we have general fund available of 340,000 with approximately un, just under $600,000 available in resources. Um, we've talked a little bit about the distinction between opportunity funds and general funds. And for this purpose, we'll combine them and talk about resources. We make the distinction in the trust because opportunity funds are generally um, resources that are funded by CPC. They have restrictions for, associated with how we can use them. And um, we tend to use them for the, those opportunistic transactions. Um, but combining them and presenting our resources in total is something that Larry suggested would be helpful. Um, so as of, um, we'll call it January of 2021, we have just under $600,000 available in resources and the claims against those resources um, total approximately $499,000. And that includes, um, and they're listed, they're detailed here in this grid, but um, starting in kind of order of the presentation, we have a property on 20, 270 Central Street um, purchased from the former owner of Habitat and um, that will require $100,000 worth of restoration work. Um, we purchased in 2019, a duplex at Road Circle and we have $140,000 worth of work that's been bid. Um, we um, have received bids. We also had add-ons priced for work that we thought um, would be appropriate, but it depended on where the, the um, bids came in and those top total approximately $20,000. So while we do have a state grant available to reimburse us for the work to be done at Road Circle, um, if we felt appropriate to do the additional work that would come from our resources. Um, the There is a unit at Ridgewood Crossing that while is in the tail end of, of litigation and we expect that to be resolved shortly. And once it is, um, we've been asked by the um, selectmen to, con to consider purchasing that and recording it on the inventory. And that price is right now estimated at 189,000. The final price will be calculated at the time of closing and be a function of the income that we um, target for the resident. And um, the next two items are um, allowances for engineering the, uh, and a project related cost, 25,000 for um, engineering work to assist with the subdivision and um, other engineering site work for 499 Cushing. Currently a three acre parcel has a single family home on it, but it also um, has land that's available to the rear that we would consider building a second, at least one second home. Um, and then Whiting Street, which is a, a parcel that we sold um, or will convey to the um, habitat has recently gone through all of its permits and as part of the condition um, issued by the ZBA, sidewalks were included and that was a budgeted, a non, a cost that was not budgeted by Habitat. So we expect they may approach us from assistance and some, some budget relief there. Um, once we have um, 
expended those funds and then for timing purposes, we'll assume that we've received reimbursement from the state for $140,000 and that these are all costs associated with our opportunity fund. We will then once again go to um, a negative or a deficit opportunity fund balance, but we'll still have 300 plus in our um, general fund for total resources available at the end of fiscal 21 of approximately $234,000. So when we start to look at what might happen um, at that point, we, we, we take a look at what would our finances or resources be if we were successful in our $700,000 application that's in front of um, CPC now. And if we were successful, that would restore the balance in our opportunity fund. And between opportunity and general fund, we'd have approximately $900,000 available. And the, um, the two primary um, categories, and this is where we, we look to how would we use those funds. Um, the first would likely be, um, earmarked for the construction of a single family home, at least one to the rear of 499 Cushing. And it's still very preliminary. So these costs are just an estimate. And frankly, they're, they're very low because we've estimated a 2,500 square foot, three bedroom home at $100 a foot. And we just don't have any other information, but it's a placeholder. And um, then the second, um, use of funds would be um, would be marked as five hundred fifty thousand dollars, and that that amount was sized based on our two most recent market purchases. Um, Road Circle and Cushing Street were purchased in twenty nineteen, and both were in the amount of five hundred twenty to five hundred thirty thousand dollars. So, with the passage of time, we're hoping that we could replicate that type of a, a transaction, um, but. Single family home is not the only um, type of purchase that we might be able to do. And some of the other options that we would consider would be uh, land acquisitions. And um, there is rear parcel, there is acreage to the rear and abutting 499 Cushing Street. And preliminary conversations have been had with that property owner. And um, if there were some successful discussions, that presents an opportunity to um, acquire property adjacent to 499 Cushing and perhaps expand that parcel and, um, and, and ultimately build more units. Um, one of the other um, potential site acquisitions is one that's received a fair amount of um, um, publicity locally, and that is the potential to expand the Lincoln School apartments through acquiring um, a small parcel from the abutter. And that is um, also a, a discussion that is, is underway, but there have been no um, finalized negotiation. There's been no letter of intent signed. There's been no purchase price um, executed. And um, before any of, that is, any of that is done with any site, um, acquisition, there'd probably be some due diligence work that would have to be done. But that is one um, um, potential uh, ac land acquisition. The Board of Selectmen parcel um, over near the train station remains a parcel that is earmarked for housing. Um, that requ would require um, a, a larger development plan and ultimately more development capital. But it is something that um, for us to move ahead with, as we had done in prior years, we would, um, uh, if we had a development partner and um, a, a identified use, we would, we would move ahead with that. And that would be a potential candidate. We have a couple of smaller um, um, tax title properties that are in our queue. They, they present some other challenges, um, but those are the types of, um, you know, that those funds might be available to um, support some of the development challenges on those sites and um, allow us to move ahead. Um, ultimately, a, a single family or another duplex purchase is, um, is attractive to us because it allows us 
to turn the units and, and, and frankly get housing created faster, but it's obviously not as many units. Um, um, and, and so at that point, um, you know, these are, this represents the true res restoration of our opportunity fund. And, um, you know, we're at no point where we're able to describe where we are in negotiations on any of these potential acquisitions. And, you know, unfortunately, um, or one of the challenges is for the trust is that we are buying property on the open market. Um, and typically those kind of discussions are done privately between two par parties. And then once terms are agreed to, then it becomes a little bit more public. Um, but in this instance where, you know, our funding comes from our community and other interested parties, people are, are interested in, in our pipeline. And to the extent that we can provide details, we will. Um, but if we haven't finalized or are still in active negotiations, it's, it's hard to, to disclose things that just aren't, aren't ready for, you know, public consumption. Um, so I, I guess I'll stop there. And um, I want to be respectful of the time limits. And, you know, I can, there are a couple things on this slide that aren't included in the text that if people would are curious about, I can walk through. There's, I think, pretty no. self-explanatory. No. Don't walk through. But if, okay. you want to, if you want to send this to me, I can send it on to people. Okay. And if they have questions, they can ask me as liaison and I'll send you the questions. Okay. I, I, think okay. That, I think you gave a good recap. As liaison, I'm, I'm just gonna go first with a quick question and then I'll open it out to the committee. I understand the numbers because I've studied them so hard and you and I and others on the trust have had so much discussion. My question is this, once the trust fix up, fixes up 270 Central and 29-31 Road Circle, does it then get to does it then sell those two properties and um, on the affordable housing market and get that money for its resources? So the way uh, once they're ready to, to to be habitated, there's one of two options. One, we could sell them and take those proceeds and restore our resources. Um, the other alternative is to continue to own them and rent them so that we have rental housing. The trust has not, um, and rental housing that's different than units in larger developments. The trust hasn't um, formally voted on which way we're planning to uh, proceed with the, those two um, properties. And I expect that's something that will happen in the next um, two meetings. Okay, but once they're ready, to go on the market either as rental units or um, private ownership, money starts to come back to right. Okay, and is that the same for Ridgewood Crossing? You purchased it and, and then either you rent it out or, set, or sell it to somebody? I, I, again, I can't, I, I believe the intent with Ridgewood Crossing is for a for sale and um, so yes, the uh, proceeds would reimburse our purchase, correct? Okay. Good to know, because that's almost a couple of hundred. So right. that, that's not a bad chunk of change. Okay, that's, those are um, my questions. Anybody else on the committee? Charlie. Oh, can you um, take us off the uh, screen share? Yeah, there you go. Charlie, go. Uh, th thank you, Amy, appreciate it. Great, great presentation. Um, Two, um, two, two questions. One is if you could elaborate on sort of, sort of estimated cost that, that you and, and the um, Housing Trust are anticipating for the Lincoln School expansion um, and as you think about it. And the second would be um, similar to the, the question I was asked for, for the Bear Cove. You know, how do you, how does, how does the group prioritize and what are the priorities among the sort of anticipated uh, projects that you've outlined here, um, sort of the, the four, four or five bubbles sure. um, and, and ranking them. So um, things are prioritized based on when they're ready to go. So I would say that, for example, um, Road Circle and 499 Cushing 
are a little bit um, earlier on because Road Circle and, and Central Street, those I think are the ones that um, Central Street probably jumps ahead of Cushing Street um, because there has to be some um, restoration done at these, these um, properties, but then they're available immediately to either sell or rent and, um, and frankly create additional affordable units for the town. Something like um, a, a 499 Cushing and uh, Lincoln School, by their very nature, which are development, require some development, they will take longer. So therefore um, they will fall into a different part of our timeline or our um, pipeline because of the time required. Um, and all of them are important, but they will, um, they will come to a natural conclusion based on their development cycles. Folks, do you mind if I chirp in a little bit here? Chirp, sure. yeah. T Tim White, I'm the chair of the Affordable Housing Trust. Uh, Amy's right that um, the ones that are closest to, to uh, fruition are, are 270 Central and Road Circle, but we haven't even started construction in either of those projects. And historically what we've learned is it's generally a two year process for us to, to turn a property. So we're, if we turn those properties in 2021, we've done very well. You have to remember, we also need to go through the state to get the properties uh, uh, included in our affordable housing uh, inventory by doing our local uh, initiative. So, and then the second thing I wanna make sure everybody understands is that whether it's a, pur a purchase of a property um, that we're talking about using the funds for is that although negotiations during the process are obviously uh, just between the parties, we are not able to make a purchase of any property without the approval of the Board of Selectmen. And that's built right into our bylaw. Charlie, did you have any follow-up questions? Um, if you were to rank your priorities right now, what would they be? Well, I'm not sure that they're ranked. I think that they're, they're, they're time developments based on um, what's ready to go. Everything is a similar priority. Uh, and again, Charlie, I think if you look at the way Amy, I think she did a nice job dividing up where our commitments are already, as opposed to looking for opportunities. Um, but you, you just never know if the opportunity may jump the commitments we already have in place because the opportunity comes up and uh, and I don't want to repeat what we talked about at the last meeting, but finding those opportunities is a, a terrific challenge. And that's why we need to be ready to move really quickly on them. Thank you. Others on the committee? Anybody? Okay, are there any specific questions about the application from members of the audience? Not. I'm for it, I'm against it. Those I want, we want to receive your letters. You can send them to cpc at hingham-ma.gov and I will make sure that every committee member gets them. But if you truly are looking for clarification on something about the application, anybody from the audience? Not yet. Okay, great. Thank you, Amy. Thanks so much and Tim, thanks to you. And thank you all for your consideration and our request. You are very welcome. Okay, next up is the Inner Harbor Study. I'm actually not sure who's presenting. Is it gonna be Bill or is it gonna be Marco? It's uh, actually, Larry, going to be Bill and Alan. Okay, you have 10 minutes combined. Bill, would you like to share your screen? No, as I'll explain, Kirsten, thank you. Um, but uh, we should screen extensively uh, when we made our original presentation and I made sure to forward that material to you and I believe all of all the members had it. So um, our, our thought this evening in the, in the relatively short time that we were allowed is to just kind of hit the high points. It's going to be uh, words from myself and from Alan. Um, Alan, as you know, has been involved with the Harbor for 12 years now, uh, seven years on the 
uh, six years on the Harbor Development Committee and now uh, coming up on six years on the Bating Beach Trustees and I, I'm, I'm in my seventh year as chair of the Harbor Development Committee. So our, our thought this evening, you know, rather than revisiting uh, materials that you have and that I think were very clear, Marco's presentation, uh, we all worked on very hard to make sure that we were giving you the full picture and uh, you have that material. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna repeat it. Uh, I will emphasize that, you know, the nature of the request is a, for a master plan. It is a design, it is not construction is to update from uh, a plan that is now 13 years old, the 2007 Harbor Master Plan pre uh, presented by um, Mark Mazzarelli. Um, Alan was just uh, coming onto the committee when, uh, when that report you know, came, into, came into being. So we've, uh, we've, we've turned, a, turned a corner already. Um, I will emphasize that the nature of our funding request is twofold, as you know. Uh, the total dollar amount requested is $75,000. That's based on a $60,000 estimate for, for the landscape uh, design portion. And that's, that's, it's not simply landscape, it's, it's activities and, 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 and the necessary structures along the harbor uh, by three firms, all of whom have done extensive uh, prior work. Two of them, uh, actually all three of them are known, known to uh, the town. Each of those firms uh, gave in their qualification statement an estimate almost very close to the $60,000 level. The other 15,000, as we've described previously, is to look to the kind of activities that might be contemplated. One of the things that we've discovered in the, in the interim time since we last met is uh, the nature of a firm uh, down in New York called uh, Place, it's called a placemaking. Amy, um, Cowan, who is the uh, president of the Hingham, uh, uh, Friends of Hingham Harbor, was aware of this firm. They are, they are somewhat one of the kind of people that we might look to for this additional activities and how we organize them and how we advertise them and how we, we plan them. Obviously, in conjunction with other stakeholders, particularly the um, uh, Recreation Commission, which of course runs many of the programs that go down along the harbor, and we know full well that we would be working with them, of course. So, you know, what is this? Um, it's it's a roadmap for the next ten years. Um, typically, master plans uh, are targeted a, at a at a ten year kind of interval. We're we're we've exceeded that, and as we've emphasized before, much of what's in the 2007 plan, as you saw from the presentations that we shared with you previously has really either been achieved or has been overtaken by events. And we're left now with some, some major uh, sections that uh, really just have, haven't been completed in this tremendous opportunity. It's an, it, it would be an investment by the town to supplement uh, millions of dollars that have already been spent by the town on the harbor and to really finish the job. Um, we will also, as you know, uh, expect that many more millions of dollars are going to be spent on the harbor area. A boat ramp is uh, in process with the state. I, I don't know, uh, it, it's their budget and their dollars, so I don't know what that's going to cost, but it's going to be to our benefit. Uh, the Route 3A project is proceeding. Judy Sneath is well aware of that, and Alan, uh, who's on the call as well, Alan Peralta are on the 3A task force. The, the estimate, I think, is 13 to 14 million dollars uh, that it's going to be, you know, on the on the harbor front, if you will, the, the highway itself. Um, and there are the, the the wharf projects that we continue to uh, to work on. Uh, they will, you know, be be rolling out over time, and again, significant dollars. Um, because all of those projects are proceeding and and are are finalizing in their plans, it's, it's really important that this master plan happen uh, soon and, and now. Arguably, you know, we're, we're late uh, in the sense of where the, where the other projects are in, in relation to where we are here. We emphasized to you at the last meeting, and I want to remind you of that slide on Marco Bohr's uh, presentation that showed the gears of uh, the different gears because there's been the confusion that you've asked about, hey, we have a, a master plan for the town as a whole. We have the 3A task force with, with some landscaping components to it. 
We have the MAPC projects, which is a, a, a vision for a sustainable, uh, both downtown and connection to the harbor. We have been uh, closely monitoring that. I've attended all of, all of their meetings. We, we've tried to make very clear to you the distinction between those two. This plan would supplement and complement uh, all of those, all of that prior work. And, and that's, you know, that's, that's the emphasis. And we, we can only assure you that by virtue of, of monitoring what's happening with each of those other projects, that there is no overlap here. Uh, this is not a case of, of redundancy, and I just want to you know, really emphasize that. Um, I will mention that um, you know, there's been discussion about stakeholders and town participants. I have been reaching out over the last couple of weeks to various parties uh, on the harbor. I've included and asked Kristen to forward to you a letter of support by Amy um, Cowan, who is the president of the Friends of Kingdom Harbor. I had a very good discussion this afternoon with um, Stuart uh, English, who's the current uh, president of Hingham Maritime. Uh, he uh, uh, understands the nature of the project, knows it's important. It, you know, where they are is somewhat ancillary to the focus, the principal focus of our work, but he gets it and he is supportive and has indicated he too will prepare a, a letter that I can forward through to, through to all of you uh, from Kirsten. The other topic that I want to revisit because it's been asked a number of times is, is on the economic side here. Um, uh, most recently, Kirsten a, a request to um, clarify with Mazzarelli Associates. Matt Mazzarelli is the uh, consultant who did the work in 2007. You know, because he would be revisiting, if you would, uh, a, 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 a landscape that he knows well. Is there a, a possibility for sort of downsizing his proposal or his call statement uh, from a you know a, a a real fully fully vetted master plan to simply kind of an update? Uh, I managed to reach him at uh, about quarter of six tonight. We spoke for about a half hour, um, and he uh, he he elaborated something like this. He said, Bill, uh, remember those, that estimate is something I gave you a year and a half ago. Um, you know, it, you, you'll remember that the original master plan cost was about $65,000. That was 13 years ago. Think about the inflation, you know, component that's uh, built into any consultant moving ahead over that time frame. And what he effectively told me is he said, Bill, I, I, I put the, the economies that will come out of my prior knowledge in the estimate that I have already given you. Uh, he is actually a little, a little worried that to do the right kind of job, uh, he, you know, it does, it, is, there, is there enough money there? So we are very conscious of wanting to make sure that the estimate that we're asking for is sufficient to the task. And I wanna just emphasize something because um, it, he, he raised, you know, an issue that Kirsten, one of Kirsten's questions sort of related to, which is, hey, how do you make sure that all of the stakeholders, all of the town parties and so forth, come together and you, and you have consensus? Well, as we've emphasized previously, that's what the nature of these studies and, and, and efforts are. And, and the biggest part of that, most important part, is the kind of visioning uh, discussions that go on at the outset. And Mark really emphasized that to me. He said, I don't want to cut short uh, the, the degree of interchange with all of the related stakeholders. So I, I just wanted to relate the economies and, and I understand your desire for a sharp pencil and getting as much out of you know, the money that we can get you know, from, from you as possible. We are incredibly mindful of that. Alan's gonna speak briefly to the RFP process, which will absolutely sift that out. Um, but we, I, I want to assure you, we want to be sure we're getting dollars for our, our you know, uh, quality for our dollars as well. So I'm going to just wrap, wrap up by saying, in, in my experience with this town, this is exactly the kind of project that a community uh, preservation committee and, and, and act should accomplish. Uh, it unites the town. Uh, around one of the most used uh, assets in the town that is used by people of all ages and, and incomes. It, it's truly egalitarian. 
You also want to emphasize that um, it, it's our belief, as, as evidenced by the Whitney Wharf project, that if we have this kind of a, a roadmap, we will be able to use it as a vehicle to obtain private funding for, for many of the elements of this uh, uh, plan as, as it would be rolled out. So this would be a pump primer as well. So with that, I'll, I'll close out just urging your support for this effort, the third time we have brought it before this committee, uh, and we are hopeful that you will be open to it. Alan, I'm gonna pass it to you. Hold on, I'm gonna take it back for a second. Thank you, Bill. Alan, Bill has spoken for more than 10 minutes. Can you say what you need to say in a minute or two? I'm sorry. Um, I'll try to do best I can in two minutes, Larry. Okay. Um, First off, we're very appreciative of past work of the CPC. That's why we're here, why we've got as much done as we have. Uh, one of the present points that Kevin Burke raised was about the RFP process. And I, I just want to stress that. You're going to ask about what this is going to cost. We have the same motivation as you to have, bring this in for the best number possible. But that's going to be based because this is worth over $25,000. The state requirement is there has to be a, a two-step solicitation process of qualifications and bid price. I think if people are eager to get this job and we have a number of firms, it won't be limited to them, then they will sharpen their pencils for us. Um, as Bill stressed, we do have quite a history of working with these other committees in town. I think we also have to stress our capability of delivering a project. I think Larry's aware, some of the other members are aware. I've been at this for going on 13 years. And a number of these projects have come to fruition and come off the planning phase. And what we wanna stress is that was a great roadmap in 2007. We're hoping to get the roadmap for 2021 and beyond. Because people like Bill and I are the gray beards on these committees. There are new members coming on. We have a selectman, we have a structural engineer, we have the uh, executive director of the Historical Society, well-balanced groups. And I think we have the capability to deliver a project, uh, but it is our best interest to bring in at the best number, but this will be a roadmap for years to come for new members of these committees and for other townspeople is what our, our goals and objectives can be. The 2007 plan was very successful and I think the next one will be too. Thank you. I do it in Thank two you. minutes. You okay. did great. Thank you. Okay. So, Kirsten, as liaison, do you have any questions or comments? Kirsten, you need to unmute. You need to unmute. I've had all mine answered and then some. So, I'm happy to pass along. And I appreciate all the time and effort that has been put into these presentations. It shows, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Any other, any questions from anybody else on the committee or comments? I, I just had, this is Vicki and I just had one question um, and maybe I uh, misheard Bill. Is 60,000 of this going for a landscape plan? Is that what I heard you say? I, I didn't think so, but I, I, I'm also the one who's taking notes, I apologize. So if you could just clarify that, it's not 60,000 for the landscape plan, is it? Vicki, uh, it is, uh, the, the components are twofold, 60,000 okay. to, to a firm to, uh, it, it, you know, when you say just a landscape. Well, plan, all right, I apologize. I'm writing. Because, because it's, it's structures and lighting and, and shade structures and okay. plantings, and it's, it is the whole thing, but it is also, you know, uh, define, working with this other other firm and or uh, the University of Massachusetts, which Alan has raised as a possible low cost or low cost source for us on uh, what do we, how do we explore further activities and the, and the marketing and, and communicating to the public about those. You know, that's, that's the other piece. And those two will work in hand in hand to come forward with a master plan that show that where that landscape designer firm have, have put onto the, the, the map, the kinds of activities that arise as we, as we go through the process of thinking through what is it that we want this harbor to be. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Judy? Um, I have a quick question. So the, the plan for the landscape is 60,000, including the hard and the soft. 
what do you estimate the investment to be to implement the plan? Judy, that's a function. Uh, I'll, I'll and, try and, that one, Bill. And, and one of the products of the, of the plan. Go ahead, go ahead, Ellen. Uh, we don't have it in front of us, Judy, but uh, years ago we did what was called the blue plan. I'm kind of dating myself. This is way back in HDC days. And the Harbor Masters actually is an ex officio member of Harbor Development Committee. Uh, but we had a plan that went into everything, wharf improvements, uh, improvements along the waterfront. So we're probably talking and it's multi-million at least. Uh, clearly some of the, actually as well, no, we're looking to dovetail, you know, where 3A leaves off. Um, so some of that maybe if it's just hardscape is not expensive. Uh, if we're talking wharf work, which we're going to MAPC get at, then obviously that's a separate issue, but they're going to have to look at that. And there's no way you could do a plan and not acknowledge the climate we're in. Uh, in fact, the 2007 plan almost did none of that. Uh, not blaming them, that wasn't his task. But this task is going to have to look at any physical changes that are going to ha happen, whether they're requirements raising walls so that the structures behind them Will, can be done physically. Um, so it depends how wide the scope is, I guess, Judy. If you want to, if you're only talking the hardscape, probably, you know, our, our boardwalks were costing us like 150,000 a piece, if you want to use a ballpark number. You know, 75,000 to 100,000 got you the boardwalk through the Grove. Um, you know, so you can probably do, you know, a fair amount. And, you know, this probably won't be the last time you'll see us. I mean, CPC has been a great avenue, but we also hope to to get grant funds. And the last grant was successful. We got 700,000 from the state because we had a master plan and we'd done the boardwalk and a few other things. So hopefully the 3A improvements, the climate change, the fact we've delivered a project for the Seaport Bond Council probably increases our chance of getting another one. Uh, but as Bill pointed out, we also wanna look at uh, integrating with the uh, Ingham Maritime. And we have three new private owners now in 2000, all the owners since 2007 along the waterfront are new. And we would hope this plan is going to identify how you get across the private parcels. That, well, we have a- That's what the Harbor Walk we did have in a Boston. Shared use path and I think that's because, another thing I want to point yeah. out. What's that? You said this plan would say how to get across the private parcels. We have a shared use path that, and sidewalk that takes you across the whole thing. But in an ideal world, Judy, you, you're talking, you'd like to do them along the waterfront too. I mean, that was the point of the Whitney Wharf Bridge was we had a, a sidewalk in front of uh, Red Eye Roasters. But I think most of us who've walked it agree that the accessing it from behind and along the waterfront, not like it's gonna be a major concession. It's a, largely in chapter 91, it's actually a requirement of private owners to provide access. So the access you're talking- We should we talk more about that. Uh, we should talk more about that offline, though, because we looked into putting the shared use path along the water and the engineers, everybody, at least between the rotary and uh, red eye and agreed that the better place for it was not right up against the water. So, but th a different question. I have one more question for you, Alan. So then the $15,000 for programming kind of how many years of programs, programs yeah. trying to get a sense of what we're getting um, for our money, how many years of programming does that get us? Like what, who's gonna do the programming? Kind of, is it just ideas? I'm not sure what what that would look like. It's largely, and Bill's right. I mean, I would say you've, you've asked every other proponent, what are your, how are you rank your priorities? So clearly our priority is the $60,000 study. Um, I think we have an opportunity hopefully with, um, you're Boston to get the better part of some of that 15,000. But the idea is more there, Judy, to look at what has been successful in other communities. How uh, some of the issues we talked about in 3A, if we improve projects and uh, do more projects, do we have more work for DPW? How have other communities dealt with that? So those, it's more those type of things than we're gonna say it's a program that costs money, but what can we sustain with these physical improvements? What type of activities would be sustainable but then what are their ramifications? What are their costs? Judy, I just want to emphasize. I know, so, it, it, I know it, it's a little it, nebulous, but. 
it can't Judy, it, made it, it, it made it sound as if you um, were, were thinking that this was actually going to pay for the programs themselves. It's, it's not that. It's to identify the kind of programming that we want to have along the, along the harbor and then how to communicate that to the town and how much would it cost? Exactly all the questions that you're asking. So by program, you mean activities like the touch a truck, like the farmer's market, like all the 4th of yes. July, all the things yes. that happen there. Yes, exactly. And also things like, uh, you know, people started a very popular concept this year and no one ever would have thought of is like a drive-in, you know, family drive-ins, like an inflatable screen and drive-in activities. Uh, there's going to be ramifications of that, but, you know, other communities have done them. Uh, and I think we really, that's really to me, is to look at other success stories, but also their costs. What did they learn from doing it? So we, we kind of get the benefit of what other communities have done and can find the things that are most applicable to Hingham. I like that drive-in idea, Alan. CPC will write you a check. That was <laughs> good place making. How much, how much, Larry? I don't know, we'll talk. We'll talk <laughs> offline. Okay. Any other questions or comments from committee members? Any uh, specific questions about the application from the floor? No. No? Okay, great. Thank you so much for the, to the four applicants for um, hard thought out presentations. We, we appreciate all your thinking and time and effort and sweat that goes into this. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanna let the group know before I ask for a motion to adjourn that I plan to send you the voting sheets at some point tomorrow. Um, I just, I wanna give uh, Claudia and Vicky a chance to talk a little, just in case any of the numbers need to be refined in terms of taking away 7% for management, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll get those sheets tomorrow. And then in my notes, you, I'll ask you to return them to Heidi Gall in the selectman's office, no later than 5 p.m. on Tuesday. And then uh, we will all meet up on Wednesday and Heidi's gonna um, do it, you know, have a sheet up that combines all of our numbers and then we talk to each other and, and come up with a final vote. And she will take minutes that night as well. And then we will pay her back from next year's administrative fund. So again, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And um, can I have a motion to adjourn? Larry, can I just say one thing before we take a motion? Yeah. I'd like to ask, um, uh, as the minute taker, I think um, the Hingham Affordable Housing Trust, I would appreciate, I mean, I'll get the minutes out as soon as possible, but we're voting next week. So mm -hmm. I would like the presentations from both Claudia and um, Hingham Affordable Housing Trust to be sent to all uh, you know, committee members, since I can't possibly get them into the minutes, okay? <laughs> okay, so Amy, you're still here. Can you send me the thing that you screen shared tonight? I know I have it, but just send it to me once more. And yes. Claudia, if you can send to Vicki your tonight's presentation, and she'll forward that to all the committee members as your liaison. Is that it's okay? already done. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And that way, when you get your minutes, you won't expect to have that all written out for you. Thank you. Okay. So Vicki, since you're such a thinking ahead smarty pants, do you want to make a motion to adjourn? <laughs> yes, I will make a motion to adjourn at 834. Does anybody want a second? Second. Okay. Uh, we have to roll call. So uh, Vicki? Yes. Larry? Yes. Judy? Yes. Kirsten? Yes. Charlie? Yes. Bill? <coughs> yes. Megan? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Great.